Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Echevarria. This is actually not the beginning of the conference. This is the beginning before the beginning. Um, this is the one-hour introductory program um, uh, and will be offered by Dan Siegel of the California Attorney General's Office and Robert Melch, Meltz of the Congressional Research Service. Um, they will proceed for an hour. Uh, we will then have the formal welcome and introduction to commence the conference. The first panel will be held uh, in this room and then there will be a break and we will proceed to the moot court uh, room uh, which is by the registration desk. And so without further delay, you're on. Well, uh, welcome everybody. It's always a pleasure to speak at the uh, premier takings conference. I think Dan and I between us have about 30 appearances at this conference. Um, we're here because of uh, 12 uh, deceptively simple words tucked away at the end of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Uh, as you can see from the slide, the Maryland Constitution has a similar provision as do roughly half the states and the other half of the states, uh, instead of saying just taken, uh, say taken or damaged, although typically the word damaged does not color the judicial interpretation of the word taken. Um, the Maryland Constitution has um, been read by the state high court as uh, being largely similar to the, to the federal uh, takings clause, although there have been some recent decisions from your court of appeals uh, saying that there are some uh, narrow situations in which the Maryland Constitution confers more um, protection. We're, to the property owner, we, we are going to be talking uh, exclusively about the federal takings clause, and that's not really much of a limitation for two reasons. One is that the uh, federal takings clause has long been int interpreted as being incorporated against the states through the 14th Amendment due process clause, and the other is that, uh, as with Maryland, most state takings clauses are construed similarly uh, to, the, uh, to the federal provision. So you can, th you can think of the takings clause as an implicit compromise. Uh, you can imagine two logical extremes. One is that the government is never allowed to take no matter how great the public need, and the other is the government can take whenever it wants uh, for whatever reason with no compensation. And between those two logical extremes is the takings clause, which says, yes, the government can take uh, recognizing a pre-constitutional pre sovereign right uh, of eminent domain, but on two constitutionally imposed conditions. One is that the taking be for a public use, and secondly, that the taking be with just compensation. Our topic is, is not direct condemnation. That's a situation where the taking is obvious, when the government files a condemnation action against the property owner or against the property in REM, and uh, and the, uh, explicitly acknowledges that it is invoking the sovereign, its sovereign power of eminent domain. Uh, the taking is less obvious when the government simply interferes with private property in some way and does not acknowledge that it is tantamount to a taking, leaving it to the property owner to uh, file an inverse condemnation. It's called inverse, of course, because it's the procedural reverse of a direct condemnation. Whoops. <laughs> a little trouble with this. Um, as is obvious from this side, slide, it has been an, an active area for the Supreme Court since 1978 when the seminal Penn Central versus New York City uh, decision came down, which sort of launched the modern era of, of the Supreme Court's effort to build a more or less coherent uh, body of law for, uh, for takings jurisprudence to determine what government actions vis-a-vis -vis property are takings and which ones are not. Uh, there's about 53 court decisions here making the takings area as active as any other constitutional area, including the First Amendment and the Fourth. Um, the cases in red are those which I think are the more doctrinally important, and we'll be mentioning a few of them uh, as the hour proceeds. So what is boiled down out of these uh, 53 court decisions since 1978 is that uh, we have four essential kinds of takings. Now. Uh, our conference sponsor, John, has urged me to also mention that there is sort of the ultimate fundamental paradigmatic taking, an appropriation taking, when the government simply says to you, your property is now ours. Uh, 
So these, th in that situation, uh, it, there's rarely uh, an issue as to whether there's a taking. These, the four items on this slide are those where uh, there, some jurisprudence has built up to determine which government actions are takings and which ones are not. Uh, first, physical occupations, then total regulatory takings, partial regulatory takings, and, and finally exaction takings, the most newly created of the four categories. If there's one takings decision of the Supreme Court that you want to look at uh, as you enter into this field, I would recommend you look at Lingle versus Chevron because that case sort of lays out the whole typology of modern takings jurisprudence. The basic inquiry, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court has said many times, and lower courts have said uh, at least a thousand times, is that, is that the purpose of the Fifth Amendment takings clause is to ask the question whether the government is forcing some people alone to bear burdens which, in all fairness and justice, should be borne by the public as a whole. Uh, I think we're going to see that that, that, that uh, exhortation by the court uh, is fairly uh, content free, but it nonetheless serves to alert both the government and the property owner that, in some sense, their arguments have to be based on fairness and not just a mechanical application of principles. So let's start with the physical taking uh, situation. These uh, next to appropriation takings are viewed as the most paradigmatic of, of takings, the first to be recognized classically in the flooding and airplane overflight cases. Um, because these are the closest to direct condemnation and, and implicate the rather fundamental and, and sacrosanct right to exclude others from your private property, uh, the, court has, the Supreme Court has said that a permanent physical occupation is a per se taking in the, in the seminal Lucas decision. Um, lesser takings uh, uh, are, are, are tested under a balancing test. So for permanent physical occupations, um, uh, this is definitely where a takings plaintiff wants to be. Um, a lot of the evidentiary and balancing complexities which often uh, can favor the government um, are not relevant to a permanent physical occupation claim. The economic impact of the government action, the, the physical magnitude of the, phys of the physical occupation, and the relevant parcel rule, which Dan is going to talk about soon, uh, all of these things are irrelevant to a permanent physical occupation claim. Uh, a permanent physical occupation, in the Supreme Court's view, includes occupations both by the government directly and by persons or things present due to the government, classically water from a government dam. It includes intermittent invasions. Uh, it includes real property, uh, physical occupation of real property, and uh, a physical occupation of personal property. We now know that from a Supreme Court decision last uh, June, which you're going to hear a lot more about as the day goes on. Uh, there is, of course, uh, as with all concepts in takings law, a blur between what is a permanent physical occupation and what is a lesser physical invasion, which uh, does not trigger per se the per se taking rule and, and is instead tested under the balancing test. There are limited defenses to a uh, permanent physical occupation claim. Uh, the most obvious one is uh, consent by the property owner. Now the Horn 2 decision, uh, the, the Supreme Court's most recent decision, uh, injected some qualification to that. There are circumstances which you can sort of think of as implicit consent, that is you embarked upon a business enterprise knowing full well what the regulatory regime was and you continually resubscribed or continued uh, to put your land to a certain use which brought it under a regulatory scheme that you were well aware of. Uh, the Horn 2 decision says explicitly or implicitly that those uh, seemingly voluntary actions by the landowner bringing him under the regulatory regime and, and continuing under the regulatory regime are not defenses to a permanent physical occupation claim. Um, there is a very limited background principle defense. Um, background principles goes to the, the concept goes to the very nature of your property right. Uh, so it comes up sometimes in the physical taking area, although it's much more a regulatory taking concept. Uh, if the physical invasion helps the landowner, that can weigh uh, in favor of the government. There is a blur between physical and regulatory takings. Um, uh, this is something which uh, uh, if, if the property owner plaintiff has any chance at all of, of putting his uh, fact pattern into the physical taking uh, pigeonhole, they, it, 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 it absolutely has to be done because of the, the vast increase in the uh, 
a chance of, of winning a physical taking case over a regulatory taking case. Um, let's move on now from physical takings to regulatory takings. Uh, these were first recognized by the Supreme Court in 1922. This is a situation in which there is no physical occupation, no physical invasion. It is purely a regulatory interference with the use, uh, possession, alienation, or otherwise enjoyment of property. Um, and the, the, the basic question the Supreme Court asked in 1922 was, does the regulation go too far? And I guess we've been largely engaged in an enterprise to flesh out that go too far standard ever since then. Um, another question which the Supreme Court has asked uh, several times in the last 20, 30 years is, is the, does the regulation, is the regulation a functional equivalent to a physical occupation or ouster? And again, recall the, the fairness and justice uh, overarching standard. So uh, with total regulatory takings, uh, remember there's two types, total and partial. With total regulatory takings, the government restriction totally eliminates the economic use and value of the, of the property. Uh, besides permanent physical occupations, this is in the court's view the closest thing to a direct condemnation and hence under the seminal Lucas decision in 1992, uh, this also triggers a per se rule. The picture is of the uh, blank, the empty lots that Lucas possessed along the uh, South Carolina shore, which he was not allowed to, to develop. Um, some of the recurring issues with the Lucas per se test for total regulatory takings. Uh, how total is total? Well, it turns out pretty total because even in the Lucas decision, uh, there was a footnote, footnote eight or nine, as I recall, which said that uh, even with a 95% diminution in value caused by the regulation that's being challenged, you're, you're almost certainly going to be in, in Penn Central balancing test uh, partial regulatory taking territory. Uh, do you look at the, the loss of economic use or, or, the, or the loss of market value, or do you look at both? Well, there's explicit authority for, for both in, this, in the Supreme Court's opinions. Uh, generally, lower courts uh, talk about economic use much more than they talk about market value, unless you're in the Court of Federal Claims, in which case they talk much more about market value than remaining economic use. Uh, expectations, the expectations of the property owner when the property was bought, um, there is some argument that that is an open question, whether they still play a role in, in, in total regulatory taking cases. Uh, by a large majority, the, the, the lower courts act as if expectations are not relevant. Um, government, um, the, uh, the other side of the coin, and far more frequent, is when the government regulatory action eliminates not all, but just some of the value of the property. Um, and th this um, is a, oops. In this, in this category, of, in this situation, we have a so-called test uh, announced by the Supreme Court in the, in the famous Penn Central case, the first decision on that long list of cases that I presented earlier. Um, and this, in this case, uh, the Supreme Court laid out uh, what some have called a test, but is, when, the more you look at it, the more you realize it's not a test at all. It's just sort of a regulatory, an analytical framework and you look at the economic impact of the government action, the extent to which it interferes with distinct in the early, in the first Supreme Court case, and then distinct became reasonable, uh, interfere with, I think it's both, uh, you, the extent to which the government action interferes with distinct and reasonable um, uh, expectations of the property owner, and finally, most uh, elastically, uh, the, the character of the government action. Uh, the Supreme Court has certainly been uh, openly acknowledged that this is an ad hoc, uh, fact-intensive, and case-by-case -case, uh, test, which often makes it difficult to generalize from one Penn, one Penn Central case to the next. So looking first at the uh, economic impact factor, um, again, as, as mentioned before, with uh, total regulatory takings, uh, you know, different courts have different emphases as to whether you look at the, the extent to which the property owner still has remaining economic use or the extent to which the property owner still has remaining market value. Um, in either case, the degree of impact required uh, in order for the economic impact factor to tip in favor of a taking 
the degree of impact required is rather severe. Um, uh, we have in, in the Court of Federal Claims where you have the most fully developed body of takings jurisprudence, uh, it's almost unheard of to have to find a regulatory taking with an economic impact of less than uh, a, with, a, with a, a diminution in property value uh, of less than 85 percent. Uh, other indicia of economic impact uh, are, are sometimes used other than the loss in market value of the property before and after the regulation. Uh, one is, uh, can the property owner reap a reasonable return? Uh, in fact, that was part of the, uh, the Penn Central analysis. Um, what is the extent of the diminution in return, and can the property owner recoup his cost basis in the property. Sometimes uh, the regulatory scheme that imposes the regulatory restriction may also provide certain benefits to the property owner, as with the transferable development rights in the Penn Central case, and that can weigh again, that can soften, lessen the economic impact factor. The reasonable investment-backed expectations factor, which takings uh, aficionados always refer to as ribbies, um, uh, we saw uh, we saw 15 years ago the demise of the absolute notice rule. That rule, there there had built up in the court decisions of the 1990s, uh, in many courts, the the sense that if you bought a property after a regulatory re regime was in place, that you were absolutely categorically precluded from bringing a taking claim under that regulatory regime. Uh, the Supreme Court in the Palazzolo case, 2001, <coughs> said no, it is not an absolute rule. Uh, however, there was an O'Connor concurrence which said yes, but the existence of the, the pre-existence of the regulatory regime is still relevant and lower, that view of, of the O'Connor concurrence has certainly carried the day. Uh, there are situations in which the pre-existing regulatory regime is given substantial weight. If you enter a so-called heavily regulated field, like banking, uh, you, will, 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 you are considered to have a lesser expectation that you will be free of further uh, stiffening of the regulatory regime. Uh, if there's evidence that you knew development might be blocked when you bought the property, again, that's going to cut against your Ribby's argument. Finally, the character factor. This uh, is viewed somewhat cynically by uh, some of the property rights uh, uh, people as being sort of a bottomless well from which courts uh, draw uh, new uh, factors with which to defeat uh, takings claims. But in any event, I think there's a fairly finite set of factors courts look at. Uh, physical invasions more likely to be takings than regulations. Um, sometimes courts will weigh the public interest versus the private burden. Um, Benefit creation is seen as being more likely to be a taking, like creation of a park, uh, than, than harm avoidance. Um, the, the Lingle decision in 2005, which said that the, the function of the takings clause is to look at the impacts of the uh, government action, uh, was initially read by some as undercutting some of the, uh, the character factors, like the weighing of public interest versus private burden. Uh, that has so far not panned out in most of the court decisions. Average reciprocity of advantage, uh, you, you, you are subjected to a restriction on your property use, but you reap benefit from the fact that others nearby are subject, subject to the same restriction. When there are direct benefits for the government in a regulatory regi regime, that may lead the court to be a little skeptical and incline a little bit toward finding a taking. When there's government bad faith, that will incline toward finding a taking. When the plaintiff's action uh, is seen as being voluntary, uh, when a doctor complains that the Medicare limits are too low and are uh, in effect a taking of his or her uh, professional services, courts invariably, invariably say, well, you don't have to participate in Medicare. Uh, so that, and that comes up in a variety of contexts. And singling out a property owner it will incline a court toward finding a taking. So with that, let me turn it over to Dan for the critical parcel as a whole issue. Thank you. Um, so you just heard that for both a total and partial regulatory taking challenge, the courts will look at the impact of a regulation on property, on a parcel. Uh, that raises the question, though, of what is the parcel that you're going to look at. Um, and in Penn, starting with Penn Central, the court, the U.S. Supreme Court stated that courts need to look at 
quote, the parcel as a whole, close quote, in determining the impact of regulation on property. Um, and this is often outcome determinative. And an example of how this could apply is in this, this illustration we have here. If a court determines that the parcel that is going to be analyzed is the parcel is, say, that lot circled in red in which, in the hypothetical, cannot be developed because it's a wetland or for some other reason, it's very likely a court is going to find either a total regulatory taking under Lucas or at least a partial taking under Penn Central. On the other hand, if a court views that parcel as part of this large subdivision of 60-odd lots in which um, mo most of the lots were developed, it's exceedingly unlikely um, that a court could find a um, regulatory taking. Now, this concept of parcel as a whole has three dimensions. Um, the first one is, is what I call the spatial or physical dimension, and that's what we saw in the last slide. Um, do you look at the whole phys one physical lot, or do you look at the entire subdivision? <coughs> And the courts aren't uniform in how they treat this, but they tend to look at um, a series of factors. And the most important factor, particularly in the federal circuit, um, is now appears to be how the, the plaintiff, how the property owner has treated the properties. Um, the courts also look at whether or not properties are contiguous or not. That's not outcome. That, that, that's not essential to find a parcel as a whole, but that's a factor looked at. They also look at whether or not the parcels are in the same ownership. Um, and finally, a number of courts have had eagle eyes looking out for strategic sales in which property owners have tried to avoid the parcel as, as a whole concept by selling properties to, to, to other individuals. Now, the parcel as a whole concept not only has the spatial aspect, but it also has a functional aspect. As um, Rob suggested, and as you hear in the, during the first panel, property rights consist of a whole bundle of rights. Some, the courts sometimes call it a bundle of sticks. The right to sell property, the right to exclude others, the right to use the property, the right to continue to use, and so on. And the courts look at the economic impact on that entire bundle of sticks in determining whether or not a regulation imposes a taking. And finally, um, starting with the Tile Sierra Preservation Council case in 2002, the um, U.S. Supreme Court case, the courts have held that there is a third temporal dimension uh, to uh, parcels as a whole, namely potential future uses of a parcel. And I want to describe that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, the courts seem to divide this concept in two different ways. One, and treat, treat the two different situations differently, one is a situation such as what was in Tao Sierra where the, a restriction from the outset was intended to be t temporary. In Tao Sierra involved a moratorium on development, so the notion was after the moratorium was over, there was potential development in the future. Uh, per, uh, permitting delays would be equivalent. There, the courts have indicated that, at least in general, the parcel includes potential future uses of the property, not just the uses during the restricted period. In contrast, there is a situation in which, from the outset, government intended a restriction to be permanent, but for some reason, lifted the, res the restriction over time. Could be as re in reaction to a lawsuit or for other reasons. There, although the law is not crystal clear, the cases s s strongly suggest that the courts will only look at the restricted period, and they will exclude in determining uh, the impact of the parcel that future, that future period. I'm now going to turn back to Rob. These uh, speaker switches are scientifically designed to keep you awake. <laughs> um, Okay. Well, let's turn to the fourth of the four categories of, uh, of takings, exaction takings. This is sort of an odd duck because in this situation, uh, the government could presumably block you from developing uh, and it would not be a taking, and yet now the government is offering to let you develop, but on a condition, a condition that you uh, develop a portion of your uh, you, de you dedicate a portion of your land for a, pub for a public purpose or make certain improvements or pay certain fees, all as a way of offsetting the impact of your development on the community. It's sort of a, the developer 
uh, pay-as-you-go uh, philosophy, which has become very popular uh, beginning in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it's used all the time by local jurisdictions. Uh, so in, again, nonetheless, uh, the Supreme Court has said that, well, there is a potential for extortion, for pressuring uh, developers to, uh, to make various dedications and concessions which the, the uh, local government would otherwise have to pay for. And so we need to impose certain outer limits under takings theory. And those are two. One is that the exaction condition affects a taking if it either lacks an essential nexus with a purpose of the permit scheme to which the condition is attached. That comes from the Nolan case in 1987. And secondly, uh, the, the burden imposed by the condition on the uh, property owner has to be roughly proportional to the burden that the development would impose on the community. So these are, this test is often referred to as the essential nexus rough proportionality test. Because it, it, it is a test which imposes more burden on the government than, um, than, a, than a straight regulatory taking case, and there are certain burdens of proof shifted to the government as well, uh, n not typically shifted in land use cases. This is a, a test which is um, referred to as heightened scrutiny and which the property rights bar has always sought to expand the applicability of. So we have uh, certain issues which have been resolved as to the scope of the exaction takings test and others which have not. The resolved issues uh, at this point seem to be one that monetary, purely monetary exactions uh, are covered. Uh, secondly, that permit denials are covered. By permit denials, I mean a situation in which the landowner says, uh, I'm not going to accede to those conditions, uh, and therefore the local government denies uh, the permit for de the development. Uh, it was initially unclear whether that could be brought under the Nolan Dolan test, because, actually, because in that situation, no conveyance of a dedication or other concession was ever made. But, but it, is, it is covered. Uh, according to the Kuhn's decision. And finally, we have a decision from the California Supreme Court last spring resolving a, uh, a major push by the property rights bar to get affordable housing restrictions covered under uh, Nolan Dolan. And at least in California, uh, we have a holding that they are not covered. Some scope issues unresolved are first, uh, does the uh, Nolan Dolan uh, essential nexus rough proportionality test apply to legislat legislatively imposed exactions as well as adjudicatively imposed exactions. Uh, the Supreme Court has suggested that it's only adjudicative, but, but there is cer there's certainly a view in some of the lower courts that there's no real reason for, for that distinction. Um, the, um, there is a debate over whether land dedications that do not allow public access uh, are covered under Nolan Dolan, and there uh, there have been and will continue to be efforts, I think, to expand Nolan Dolan out of the land use context which uh, gave it birth. And now, uh, Dan. Okay, I'm not now going to talk about um, key procedural thresholds and then key th substantive thresholds required for a takings claim. Ripeness is one of the key procedural requirements in bringing a takings claim. And ripeness uh, requirements were first articulated in the Williamson County case in 1983. And there are two components, often called two prongs, of this ripeness requirement. One is the final decision requirement, and the, the second is the compensation uh, requirement. I'll discuss both of those in a minute. Uh, the court, U.S. Supreme Court, in a number of decisions has recently held that these requirements are prudential, not jurisdictional. In other words, they can be waived. A court does not have to apply these in every case. The first ripeness, the first ripeness prong is a final decision requirement. And that requirement requires, um, as uh, the Palazzolo decision explained, that uses of property be, quote, known to a reasonable degree of certainty, close quote. That means, for example, if um, under a local government ordinance, variances are permitted, um, an app, a, a developer would need to apply for a variance in order to ripen his or her clay, uh, case. 
Also, um, the courts have held that a single grandiose scheme is insufficient to ripen a, a claim that that subs a subsequent application, more realistic application, and this, this would be for a land use development, needs to be filed before a, a claim can ripen. Now there are exceptions. For a, um, for a physical taking claim, there's no ripeness requirement. Also, for a facial challenge, um, there's no ripeness requirement. Now a facial challenge asserts that a regulation, once it's enacted, no matter how it is applied, is going to oppose a taking. And since the assertion is that no matter how it's applied, the courts don't need to see how the, how the regulation is applied. They will simply look at, is it true that every single possible application would impose a taking? So, that, so for a facial challenge, there's no ripeness requirement. The second prong that I mentioned is the state, is the compensation requirement. And in Williamson County, the court, um, focused on the takings clause provision that doesn't prohibit takings, but they, it prohibits takings, quote, without just compensation. And the court held that therefore, um, and a, before bringing a taking claim in federal court, a property owner needs to first seek compensation um, in, in state, which usually means state court, using available state procedures. Um, the court explained that the, that requirement does not exist if procedures are unavailable or inadequate. Um, one exception to that is where a property owner assert, asserts that there's a lack of public use um, in what government is planning to do. Um, a public, public, a taking without public use is prohibited even if just compensation is paid. Therefore, there's no just compensation uh, there's no requirement that one seek just compensation before uh, bringing a public use claim. Second important uh, procedural threshold, and one that often leads to rejections of takings claims, is statute of limitations. Um, and I'll discuss the two aspects of the statute, both the length and, and when a statute of limitation accrues. Um, now, for, in some situations, determining the statute of limitations is very easy. Um, and lawsuits brought against the federal government under the Tucker Act or the Little Tucker Act is a six-year statute of limitations. In cases brought against state and local governments um, under federal law, whether in federal court or state court, litigants usually le use the Civil Rights Acts, uh, U uh, 42 U.S.C. Section 1983, to bring those claims. And the, statute of the U.S. Supreme Court has held that the statute of limitations for those claims um, is the same as the personal injury statute of limitation in the state in which a litigant, litigant is, is bringing their claim. So that's fairly straightforward. For cases brought in state court um, against a state or, uh, state or local um, entity under state law, in some states, it, the statute of limitations is very clear. For those of you from Maryland, it's three years, and there's no ambiguity about that. For litigants in other states, including mine and states such as Alaska, it's, it's not clear. In, in Cal I, I'm from California, and in California, the courts have held that the statute of limitation depends upon the, quote, gravamen of the claim. So if a claim looks like it involves a Subdivision Map Act, they look to the, what's the statute of limitation for the Subdivision Map Act. If it's against the California Coastal Commission, what's the limitation for cases against the, the California Coastal Commission, and so on. But luckily, folks in Maryland have it much easier. And the second question is, when does, this, when does the clock start to run? When does the statute of limitations accrue? And for a, rate, for a regulatory taking claim, uh, it depends upon whether or not the claim is a facial claim or a as-applied claim. It's a facial claim asserting that the regulation, no matter how it's applied, imposes a taking, then the clock starts to run on the date that the measure is enacted. On the other hand, if the claim is that the way that a regulation is being applied to my property imposes a taking, then the clock doesn't start to run until government has reached a final decision as to how the regulation is applied to the property. And this, is, this concept is closely related to the ripeness concept that I talked about earlier. <clears throat> 
where the claim is that a government has physically invaded property, um, that's often simple to determine, but in some cases, such as where government builds a dam and, and land is being flooded, it's sometimes less clear when, 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 when the statute should um, start to run. And the courts have held that when the statute starts to run when the situation has stabilized, and the courts have refined that to say when basically when the extent of damages um, are foreseeable, that's when the statute starts to run. Okay, I'm next going to talk about six important substantive thresholds for bringing a takings case. The first and a key central um, threshold for a property case is that one have a property interest. Absent a property interest, there's no right to bring a, a claim. And we'll be hearing, you'll be hearing more about property interest during the first panel. Um, but the, the initial question in, takings, in some taking cases is, are, is there even a property interest involved? Uh, property interests are usually defined by state law, but the fact that they're f defined by state law doesn't mean that a state can avoid a taking by simply changing its, its law. Uh, the court in the Lucas case does, um, limited states' ability to, change, to, to undermine property interests um, under the so-called background principles concept that, that Rob talked about, um, namely background principles of property of, and nuisance law. <coughs> in Lucas, the, the court indicated basically that, that laws need to be at least long-standing, and that was undefined, in, in order, to, in order to, um, to be considered state law um, uh, limitations. On the other hand, as, as Rob indicated, there's this concept of investment-backed expectations, and more recent laws can be taken into account in determining whether or not expectations should have been altered as a result of more recent law. Now, the concept of property interest under the takings clause is not the same as it is under the due process clause. Um, that said, if, if you're doing, dealing with land use, almost any interest in land will amount to a property interest. Um, some of the areas in which there is no property interest would be, say, a permit or a license, if the permit or license is revocable and non-transferable. Um, also, government benefits are not considered a property interest under the takings clause unless they're contractual. Um, the one property interest that the courts have risen as being more important um, uh, than most others is the right to exclude. Another fundamental threshold is whether or not government is acting in a sovereign capacity or is it acting as just one another player? Um, is it acting in a proprietary capacity? The takings clause does not apply to government solely acting in a proprietary capacity. Um, so for example, um, if government's involved in a commercial, solely involved in a commercial transaction, or it's asserting its property rights, saying by bringing a quiet title action, that would not trigger the takings clause. Um, the exception is where government, although acting in a commercial capacity, is using its sovereign authority um, to enforce its rights or to further its interests, such as by bringing a cease and desist order or threatening to bring a cease and desist order. So if it's standing in different shoes than a, 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 a normal property owner, um, the takings clause might be implicated. Another important substantive threshold is sovereign immunity. Uh, this does not apply in lawsuits brought against the federal uh, government um, under the Tucker Act or Little Tucker Act. Which Congress has waived sovereign immunity under those acts. Um, in contrast, states have, 11th Amen have sovereign immunity under the 11th Amendment. And the sovereign immunity bars federal court compensation suits against a state. It does not bar state, or uh, uh, this had been an open question until a few years ago, but now most, most lower courts hold that the 11th Amendment does not bar a just compensation claim against a state that if it's brought in state court. Uh, local governments have no sovereign immunity. Another 
key substantive requirement of the takings clause is that a taking be for a public use. It's part of the takings clause. Uh, the courts have defined public use uh, most recently in the Kelo decision, but in numerous prior decisions, very, very broadly. Basically, the use needs to be, quote, rationally related to a conceivable public purpose. And the Kelo decision, Justice Kennedy provided a critical fifth vote, and he mused, he said, well, there may be some situations in which a more demanding standard is required. If it looks like this is obvious abuse, um, maybe there should be a more demanding standard. He didn't say there is, but he's kind of laying, laying the, the groundwork for a potential potentially different standard in the future in certain cases. So very briefly, two other substantive requirements are what first that government action be authorized. For example, was the agency or was the officer authorized to do what the agency or, or, or officer did? Um, if something is not within the scope of one's duties, the courts have held that there, there could be no the government has not, um, it ha has not potentially um, committed a taking. There, there may be claims against the private individual or other claims, but there wouldn't be a taking claim. Um, and finally, causation is a required element in takings claims, and that's, uh, the courts have described that as both proximate and foreseeable um, elements of causation. And finally, I want to talk about six claims that litigants, may, I shouldn't be doing this probably as a government attorney, but that litigants who want to bring takings claims may want to think about um, joining with or, or instead of bringing a takings claim. Um, one is a substantive due process claim. Now it used to be there was tremendous overlap before the Lingle decision uh, between substantive due process and, and takings claims because takings used to look at whether or not a uh, a regulation substantially advances a legitimate governmental interest. That no lo that's no longer following Lingle a takings claim. But a similar kind of claim could be brought under substantive due process. The test is a stricter one. Um, it's an arbitrary uh, test. Um, in Lingle, the court called it so arbitrary as to uh, violate substantive due process. Um, and other courts call it, use, call it rational basis. Um, Somewhat related, uh, the claims could be brought under the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, the court, U.S. Supreme Court, a number of years ago held that, that you do not need to have a large class that's discriminated against to bring this kind of claim. There could be a single individual, so-called class as one, that's being treated differently than everyone else. Uh, the cases have held that, a, a ration, that there's a high threshold for establishing an equal protection claim. It's a, a rational basis test. And in addition, all the lower courts have indicated that there also needs to be a showing that government acted with ill will. So those are two independent elements that are required for an equal protection claim. There's sometimes overlap with the Fourth Amendment, which prohibits unreasonable seizures. And one classic case involved a city that published a trail map that happened to have trails going through someone's backyard. And the, even, even when the landowner tried to get the, um, the, the map rescinded and taken off the net, taken off the net uh, it remained there. And the, I believe it was the Fourth Circuit held that in that situation, <coughs> the landowner potentially um, stated a Fourth Amendment claim. Final three um, related claims are breach of contract. Um, there's a courts have questioned whether or not if there's a potential breach of contract claim against the government, there can also be a taking claim. Some cases have said that the, 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 that, that the courts that in contractual relationship, government's not acting in a sovereign capacity. I talked about that earlier. Rather, it's acting in, a, in just one other player it's in its proprietary capacity. Courts have also suggested that there can't be a denial of just compensation until the contract claim is played out. If a, if a, if a person wins on the contract claim, then they're paid damages, which presumably would be equivalent to just compensation. 
so there's no, there would be no denial of just compensation. There's sometimes overlap between tort law and, and physical takings. Um, usually where there's a, the biggest distinction is where an imposition is, is relatively small, it's unlikely to arise to a taking, but it still might be a tort. Where the, where the imposition is larger, there could be a direct overlap. And finally, a number of states have adopted their own property rights laws that are, in essence, modifications of state and federal takings law. Um, one of the, the stricter, strictest examples comes out of Arizona, which, <coughs> excuse me, um, which adopted a law stating that any, any new regulation that reduces by any amount the value of property in land requires just compensation with some exceptions. Um, some, some other property laws are, take lesser um, versions of that. I believe Texas has a 40% diminution in value law, and a number of states have these kinds of laws, but only apply to certain kind of properties, such as agricultural properties or forestry properties. And with that, I'll turn back to Rob. Well, let's suppose you've been victorious, you, you the uh, plaintiff. Uh, the question then arises, what is your remedy? And two possibilities are the just compensation mentioned explicitly in the takings clause and the other possibility, which would leave the government action valid, uh, simply requiring the government to pay you and uh, presumably obtain some sort of property interest uh, in return for that payment, either, pay, either past or, or future. Uh, alternatively, uh, there may be some situations, of which I'll get to, in which you seek instead some sort of injunction or invalidation remedy. So the monetary remedy, again, being explicitly dictated by the Fifth Amendment takings clause uh, and the takings clauses of all the state constitutions, uh, is used in almost all takings cases. Generally, it's some a variation of market value, and I, I'm not going to go through these various um, situations with entire and partial physical takings and regulatory takings. But uh, you know, market value, what a willing buyer would pay to a willing seller, uh, I'm sorry, what a willing seller would pay to a willing buyer, neither one obligated to transact, each one fully informed of all relevant market factors, uh, will be a, a key part of the uh, compensation. There are some other standards, uh, not, uh, not the classic fair market value one. Uh, in, in the temporary taking situation, the, the standard of compensation is often said to be fair rental value. Uh, there are some cases in the Court of Federal Claims in which when the government, say, dumps a bunch of gravel on your property, uh, the, uh, the court will say that the standard of compensation is, as they put it, cost to cure the cost to remove the uh, physical invasion. Prejudgment interest is required constitutionally, uh, so you don't have to be able to point, in the case of the United States, as a defendant to a statute authorizing prejudgment interest because it's constitutionally based. Uh, there are, because inevitably in a takings case, the taking occurred uh, substantially before the moment when the government offers you the compensation check, there will always be a significant amount of uh, interest accumulated, sometimes an amount of money greater than the, uh, than the compensation for the initial taking. And, and, and a little different than the usual rule with expert witness testimony, the owner of property can testify about its value. So turning to the, the more esoteric but increasingly getting more attention, uh, remedy of, of, of seeking invalidation of the government action, no compensation. Uh, again, ordinarily not allowed because of the language in the, in the Fifth Amendment, but we, uh, a bunch of situations have developed uh, in Supreme Court cases in which uh, the invalidation remedy has been approved. One is, if, you are, if your argument uh, is that the government action was not for a public use, a difficult argument, Again, as Dan mentioned, because of the Kelo case, uh, taking a very expansive view of, of public use and, and prior Supreme Court decisions doing as well. But there are some cases in which uh, the plaintiff has been successful, arguing that the government action was not for public use, in which case the remedy is invalidation and not compensation. Uh, if you can show that there has been no sovereign immunity waiver allowing you to seek compensation, uh, 
the courts will be open to uh, a, an invalidation remedy. Money takings are situations where uh, you allege that uh, being required to pay money under some regulatory regime is in effect a taking. The Supreme Court in the Eastern Enterprises case in the late 90s recognized that it would be somewhat nonsensical to say the government has to compensate you one dollar for every dollar you have to pay out under the scheme. And so the court in that case was open to an invalidation remedy. And th these, uh, g having an invalidation remedy can have uh, a major jurisdictional uh, consequence at least with the federal government where you have to go to a different court if you're seeking an invalidation remedy as opposed to seeking a compensation remedy. And finally, there are some other situations. Um, in the Indian allotment cases, the Supreme Court seemed to indicate that there are certain rights that are so sacrosanct and fundamental, like the right to inherit, that the court will be open to an invalidation remedy and not a compensation remedy. The, um, the Horn decision, um, Horn 1, uh, seem to open up the possibility that in some cases you can defend an enforcement action brought against you by the government for collection of a penalty by arguing that the, that the regulation, your noncompliance with which gave rise to the penalty, um, that, that, uh, that that enforcement action could be defended on the basis of the, the, the underlying regulation uh, affecting a taking of your property, but we're probably going to see more on the scope of that exception. I know John Echevarria regards it as relatively narrow at present. And with that, I think we'll conclude. Um, we're opening it up now to Q&A, and uh, on the possibility that Dan and I together don't know everything there is to know, I, uh, any takings mavens in the audience should feel free to chime in answering any questions. Are there any questions? Ah, yes. My understanding is that if either, if both tests have to be met in order for the condition not to be a taking under Nolan Dolan. To, to what extent has Agen survived following Lingle? Oh. oh. Well, it, it's, I think it's survived. It really hasn't survived in that it's been refined by Nolan and Dolan. So, so the Nolan and Dolan are, you know, Nolan, Nolan indicated that the, that the substantially advances or suggested substantially advances was a source of the test articulated in Nolan, um, the essential nexus and, and similarly the subsequent um, rough proportionality test in Dolan. But Agins itself is, I think we both say, is, is dead. An interesting fact, which I'm sure you all know, is that Supreme Court decisions sometimes take a decade or two to percolate down <laughs> to lower courts. And I, st I was just reading a court decision the other day talking about failure to substantially advance as part of a takings analysis in a state court. Um, and might have been under a state constitution, which would explain it. Yeah, yeah, mo mo most, most states do follow. Um, you know the, the federal decision uh, takings decisions, as, as Rob mentioned. But it is possible that a state would decide that it it it, it wants to impose a, an, a, an additional requirement. So, yeah. I, the one area where state takings clauses have been construed most differently than the federal takings clause is uh, before and after the Kelo decision on the question of what constitutes a public use. Both before and after Kelo, there were state uh, Supreme Courts which construed public use and state takings clauses not to include uh, economic development, as the Supreme Court found was within the public use phrase in the federal constitution. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. And miraculously, we have finished on time. <laughs>